So good morning, everyone. I will reintroduce myself. I'm Stefano Ciavatta. I'm a scientist here at the Plymouth Marine Laboratory and also at the National Center for Earth Observations. And, and my, my work is uh, ecosystem modeling and in particular specialized in the assimilation of ocean color products into these models. So we will see what all this is about. This should have been a movie, it's not. But on the left, we have a model output. On the right, we have an image of ocean color. This should be imagined progressing day by day through a 10-year simulation that we have run. So we have the same kind of information here, surface chlorophyll hmm, in the northeast Atlantic. But we can see that these two uh, pieces of information are quite different. Can we somehow merge this different information to obtain a better understanding and quantification and assessment of the state of the system? So we are looking for synergies between models and ocean color. So you see that we have some problems here. Here we have missing data. The model for that area has some output. But we can see also that, for example, uh, the model, the data see out of the coast of Norway, quite high values of chlorophyll that we didn't see on the model. So the two pieces of information are different. Let's try to merge and to see if we can obtain a better understanding of the system. So on one hand, we can use the model to interpolate in space and in time the data that we are missing. We can use the model to predict the evolution of chlorophyll in the system, something that the satellite cannot do, it cannot predict. And we can use the model to uh, interpret what's going on in the observation. We can try to explain, for example, the effect of currents on the distribution of chlorophyll that we observe from space. On the other hand, ocean color can be used to calibrate the model, that means, for example, to find the values of the parameters that are in the model. We can use it to validate the model, and this will be the subject, one of the subjects of this talk. We can use the ocean color to initialize the simulation hmm, as initial condition from which we start our, the simulation of the ecosystem using the marine models, or to set the boundary values, or also as a forcing function. Okay. A lot of words that maybe doesn't mean that much from you, uh, to you, but we will talk about model, valid uh, model validation and another technique for merging models and ocean color, which is data simulation. In this approach that we will explore today, we are really merging in real time, sometime, the two pieces of information to get a better picture of the true state of the ecosystem all terms that we will explain in this talk. So the table of contents, so we will, uh, maybe not everyone knows what is a, a marine uh, ecosystem model, so just a few words on that, how we can use ocean color to validate these kind of models, and what is validation actually, how we can assimilate ocean color into models, and then I will focus mainly, and hope to have time, uh, on uh, state-of-the-art examples on data simulation, which include the, um, uh, the, the evaluation of the, oxygen, of the risk of oxygen deficiency at the bottom of a shelf sea, assimilating ocean coral into a model, how we can use assimilation to detect global trends of phytoplankton biomass, new work with new types of data, assimilation of plankton functional types into marine models, and also a very nice example, I think, where uh, people have assimilated uh, remote sensing reflectance into a marine ecosystem model, a paper that came out last year, and some take home. Messages. So what is a marine ecosystem model? Uh, a generic definition. A model is a simple representation of a complex phenomenon. Uh, we can just produce a conceptual diagram, mm, a flow chart, representing the processes in the ecosystem. Uh, uh, solar irradiance produce, arrow produce 
growth of phytoplankton, a conceptual model. Or we can go uh, with a more formal mathematical description of the processes that are going on in the system. And where well, we are using some mathematical uh, formulation to express relationship among variables that characterize the ecosystem. We can divide mathematical models in two categories, empirical models, or called also uh, black box models, for example, or mechanistic models that look at the processes that are driving the evolution of the system. So an example of an empirical model, this is a paper by Brown uh, that looking at lakes, uh, they measured uh, or they collect information on the total phosphorus concentration in lakes and on maximum value of chlor and chlorophyll concentrations in these lakes. They were able to find relationships among the total phosphorus in the lakes and the values of the total uh, of the maximum values of chlorophyll in the same lakes. So they represented some empirical relationship, hmm? a regression, and some more complicated uh, polynomial function. These kind of models can be very useful to make prediction. If I know, if I imagine that tomorrow there will be 100 total phosphorus, on the base of this simple line, I can say, OK, there will be a maximum chlorophyll concentration of 1,000. But they are not telling you nothing about the processes that relate these two variables. And this is done by mechanistic models, in which you, uh, you define a set of, of equations that describe the processes that are occurring in the ecosystem. So in this kind of approach, we represent a natural system through model state variables, A, B, C, D, hmm, which are related by processes or fluxes. These fluxes can be related or can be parameterized through some model parameters. And we describe and uh, we can represent the change in time of the state variable C as a difference of the two fluxes. Just to make an example more related to this course, in, marine, in a marine ecosystem model, state variables, mm, variables that characterize the state of the ecosystem, that's why state, can be the phytoplankton biomass as chlorophyll concentration or as carbon concentration or nutrient concentrations. The fluxes are primary production. You heard from Shuba yesterday, what is that? Uh, and parameters mm, of this model will be, for example, the rate, the maximum production rate of phytoplankton or the rate of mineralization of organic matter and stuff like that. So this very simply. A little bit more realistically, hmm, this is phytoplankton in the middle that we can quantify its biomass in terms of chlorophyll concentration or carbon concentration or nutrient concentration, nitrogen and phosphorus, hmm, because phytoplankton, okay, we talk about that later. So, and this phytoplankton in our marine ecosystem it's the center of fluxes, of processes, which are here represented, for example. Okay, phytoplankton produces CO2 via photosynthesis, consumes CO2 via respiration, is grazed by Z, zooplankton, and excrete or, or through lysis, release dissolved organic matter or particular organic matter in the environment and uptake nutrients for its growth. So all processes that we put in this differential equation, which describe the variation of the concentration of the phytoplankton in relation to the different processes. Okay, we have Z, CO2, N, DOM, which are state variables. We have also forcing function, hmm, the irradiance and the temperature, which influence these processes as external forcings or drivers. I'm just mentioning some terminology that will occur during this talk. At any moment, if something is not clear, please stop me and we can uh, see the point. So, uh, yeah, phytoplankton, I said, can give, be expressed chlorophyll, carbon, and nutrient uh, because uh, in the past, above all, uh, we were representing uh, fixed ratios of these 
uh, components of phytoplankton according to redfield ratios, while more modern models uh, express the variability of the internal ratio of chlorophyll and carbon, for example, as a function of the adaptation to light. And so the more modern models uh, express the phytoplankton concentration as in terms of concentration of the three uh, components that can change on time. This bit of ecosystem fits into larger marine models where we have many state variables, many processes, many forcing functions, and this is just one of the many examples. This is the schematic dry diagram of the, oh sorry, of the European uh, Regional Seas Ecosystem Model, which is the one that we are using here at PML. If you are interested in it, you can download it at this website and browse instruction to how to use it and so on for simple applications. So I encourage you, if you are interested, to download it and use it. And this is, I mean, a more complex model, 50 state variables, uh, hundreds of parameters which describe, for example, the uh, dynamic of four phytoplankton groups, picophytoplankton, nanophytoplankton, microphyto or dinoflagellates and diatoms, hmm? four groups of phytoplankton, functional types with uh, variable stoichiometry, hmm? the internal ratio of chlorophyll to carbon is variable, model, modeled as a uh, by using the guider formulation and so on, but it's all kind of details that we don't really need today. We have three functional groups for zooplankton, and we have bacteria, we have uh, a carbonate system that describe the evolution of PCO2, pH, and so on. We have also a benthic module, and the pelagic uh, is exchanging fluxes with it, and so on. So, but what's interesting in this occasion is that we have, you have seen, I think, this slide from Shuba, where all the variables that you can observe from space are in green, okay? These variables, you can find them as output of this model. Not really all of them, but it's okay. Uh, so, for example, okay, a total phytoplankton, as chlorophyll concentration that you observe from space can be described as the sum of the chlorophyll content of these four phytoplankton groups. Or you can have, there is also a bio-optical module, so variables like uh, phytoplankton absorption can be related hmm, to the model and to the, to the ocean color observations. But please be careful that not always one variable output of the model maps or correspond to a variable that you observe from space. Just an example, which is quite interesting, is POC, particular organic carbon. I don't know if you have seen, but you have many different algorithms that give you the POC concentration from ocean color, and they can be very different from each other. So which one of these we compare to the output of the model. Already this is a difference. But just think, uh, simply think that POC that you observe from space, for example, include also bacteria, hmm? the backscattering of bacteria. But very few marine models describe bacteria. ERSEM is one of these, but many others that are used in Earth system models do not. So when you are comparing the POC from the two, you are missing one piece of information. These kind of things occur for many other variables. And let's keep in mind that. So when you have your model, you start a simulation. For example, here in time, you describe the evolution of the chlorophyll concentration. We will call it this model output or reference model simulation. Okay? Then you have your ocean color data, and you can compare the two to assess the, how close they are to each other a very first definition of model validation, but we will go back on that. Okay, so this is the model output that we are considering. Actually, these kind of models, most of the time, are coupled to models that describe the physics of the ecosystem. And here we have, oh, sorry. Here we have the physical model, which is Polcom since this case. And once the biogeochemical model is coupled with the physical model, you can apply it on 3D uh, 
uh, 3D uh, domains to describe real ecosystems ranging from estuaries to global models. Hmm? And this kind of application, and then you can apply these couple models for a, very, a big range of applications. Harmful algal blooms, uh, study of the climate impact on ecosystems, and so on. So, this is the nice pictures that we have, but behind these kind of models, there is a lot of code. Most of the time, they're not very user-friendly Fortran that you have to code, you have to run them in very huge machine. This is a, a picture of Archer, the supercomputer uh, here in UK. And after all this, which, is, which might be not very funny, you can obtain your output, which is a map in this uh, example. And it's this map that you are going to compare, for example, with your obs observation of ocean color. So, now we try we look how we can compare this through model validation. We will give some definition and very few uh, methodological aspects, and I will cover just validation methods that will be useful to understand the case studies of data simulation. So it's, of course, not a comprehensive, just a picture, an overview. So what is model validation? I took this definition from the book Fundamentals of Ecological Modeling by Jorgensen and Bedoricchio. Validation consists of an objective test on how well the model output uh, fits the data. Very simple. Some, uh, some key uh, points. Anytime you are using a model, you should try to validate it. I mean, to assess how much reliable and how much descriptive of your data it is. You should use data that are independent. It means, for example, if you have used a set of data to calibrate your model, that means to evaluate the values of the parameters, you should use a different data set to assess how this model performs. And validation criteria and methods should be um, targeted on the objective of your modeling exercise. However, there is also, when you are talking about model validation, this other terminology that you can find, which is skill assessment. Hmm? For example, there is this uh, special, special issue of uh, journal marine systems that I recommend you to, to read if you are interested. A lot of papers on uh, validation of marine models, also a couple of articles referring in particular to satellite. So the skill is the fidelity of model behavior to truth. And the assessment is a, not, uh, a, a human judgment about this scale. This is quite an interesting thing because in the previous definition of validation, we were looking just at the mismatch between data and model as validation. But actually, there is some truth, some real value of chlorophyll concentration, which is not the data of from ocean color is not the output of the model, but it may be someone in the between. So what we are really interested, it's not the mismatch between data and model, but we want to assess what's the, our, the distance from the true value of that variable in the system. Okay? So this is a concept that will come back when I will be talking about data simulation. Now, with data validation, uh, model validation, I will be focusing on the misfit between data and model. So, when you are comparing the two, first step, as you know, satellite, you know better than me, satellites are on pixels, while the model output, it's often on 3D uh, grids that in which you have decomposed your ecosystem. So you have to bring the data from satellite and the model output to the same grid. You have to mask your model output where the, some cloud cover can have uh, cause uh, that you have no data in that point, so you have to bring on the same uh, numerosity of the model output and data, and then you compare the two and you apply your techniques of model validation. So, for example, uh, here we have the, the frames of the movies that I wanted to show you. We have temporal evolution of total chlorophyll from a model simulation and images from a satellite. And we obtain, for example, an average value on the same grid for uh, the value of the surface chlorophyll concentration 
in the Northeast Atlantic. So at this point, when we arrive at this stage, we can apply some mathematical tools to quantify the difference between the two. We can apply this kind of approach, point-to-point -point comparison, where at each grid point we are compare the value of the data with the value of the model output by assessing the bias, to compare the variability, the standard deviation of the satellite data compared to the standard deviation of the model, the root mean square deviation, unbiased root mean square deviation, and correlation between the evolution at the grid points between uh, model and data. So these should be all quantities that you have encountered in your studies, so I will not spend a lot of time. Uh, just to, uh, I wanted actually to mention uh, this recent statement by the American um, Statistical Society. Be careful when you are applying p-values, uh, the meaning of p-value in your assessment of uh, correspondence between model output and because there is a lot of issues, but I will not go inside uh, this topic. So you can represent these skill metrics in these kind of plots, which are called target diagrams, where you are simply presenting the root mean square deviation divided by standard deviation of the observation multiplied by the sign of the difference between the two and the bias. And you represent so the value of the skill metrics in these kind of plots that are very useful to visualize the skill of your model. The closer the point to the center, the better is the skill of the model for that variable when you are comparing, like in this case, to in situ data. So for example, T is temperature, it's very close to the center, the model has skill for this variable. Ammonia, it's far from the center, the model has not skill for that variable. Okay? But this kind of metrics, uh, often called parametrics, rely on the kind of assumption for example, they have a Gaussian distribution. These kind of metrics uh, really feel uh, the influence of outliers. If you have a peak in the value of temperature, which is not represented by the model, this will degrade the skill much more than uh, in other situations. So what we like to use is robust skill metrics, which do not rely on the Gaussian assumption of the distribution of model and data, but look, for example, at the median and the percentiles of the distribution. And so you can get some uh, skill metrics like the bias, like the uh, mean absolute error that correspond more or less to what we have seen and we know very well, root mean square deviation and so on, but by using uh, a, um, an approach that does not rely on the uh, assumption of Gaussianity. So also this kind of metrics, we can represent them in target diagrams. And here I'm showing you the difference of the skill of a model output uh, with respect in situ data using the same data set, same model output and so on, by using the two different uh, approaches, parametric and non-parametric, and the differences in the evaluation of the skill that we will obtain. For example, here, in here we see that uh, for salinity the skill was low and here it's higher. Or for example, all the points here are moved on the left simply because the standard deviation of the observation is higher than the one of the model because of outliers in the data. When we remove these outliers, we see that we obtain a different uh, skill assessment for this data set. So this to say, be careful to the assumption of the skill metrics that you are using for model validation and uh, consider if using metrics that do not rely on Gaussian assumptions. Yeah. And what should we do in this case? What metric do you prefer? Yeah, uh, always, uh, yeah, it's not easy. For example, I was uh, expecting this question, and uh, let's see the oxygen, for example, the oxygen concentration. If you are interested in peaks of oxygen concentration, because, for example, a very low value of oxygen, even once, but can kill your aquaculture system, you are interested in that uh, outlier. 
So you are not going to use a robust that cut out that value, but you are going to use a Gaussian. This is my fault and my possible answer. So it really depends from the application that you are considering. You can do that, yeah, in the sense, uh, re you mean spatial regions? In certain areas would be better than the you mean area, area, for example, the shelf, this kind of area? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, it's kind of exercise that I do. For example, in the uh, case studies, I selected just subsets of data for the shelf because my focus was the shelf. Mm -hmm. So. And you can see different skills for different areas of the domain. Definitely true. Other questions? Mm. The end is 12 or 12.30 of the lesson? 12.30. Ah, OK. Uh, wow, so long. I'm sorry for you guys. <laughs> so some lessons from these very first slides. OK. The matrix can be objective. Ah, we are using com numerical things and so on. But we see two different methods, two different skill assessments. So be careful the skill that you are skill metric that you are using and why you are using. And also, again, an example on use the right metric for your application. If you are interested in catching the seasonal, the seasonality, the correspondence between seasonal uh, cycles in the data in the model. You want to use, for example, the correlation between the two, not the root mean square deviation that gives you just an average value of the mismatch between the two. The correlation tells you something about if uh, the, this, the temporal evolution of the two there is a correspondence, so these kind of things. But let's go. Now we have just seen a uh, matrix defining a single value that we can plot in the target diagram, but here we have uh, spatial information that somehow we want to conserve to assess the output of our model. So for example, sorry, we can compute the bias between these two model output and satellite and so we keep information on where the model has mis mismatches or not. For example, we see that the model is underestimating the ocean color around the coast while all over the basin there is a positive bias of the model. So different skill in different areas. And for example, here also, the overestimation is higher, and so on. And so we, you can start to try to think, wow, why my model is not working? Do you try and include the uncertainty in the satellite measurement? Uh, no, not in this stage. Yes, I do agree. We know that the undercoast, often ocean coral is not really reliable. This is when. These were CCI data, so there is a treatment, and this version 3, yes, so there is a treatment for the um, for, for coastal waters, case 2 waters, but still we see that the model is underestimating, and quite likely this is due to actually uh, two high values in the ocean color data. Yeah, we are aware of this. It's a nice thing in that assimilation we will see later, you explicitly take into account the errors of the observation to get a more realistic picture of the truth. We will talk about truth over that. So bias, but this is just a static image. If we look at the root mean square deviation between uh, the time series at each point, we can also include a, a time consideration on this, or we can compute the person Pearson correlation between the two at each point. For example, here, uh, very high correlation, relatively high correlation in most of the basin, but the model is not doing well under coast. But again, ocean color might be wrong over there. We will see. Uh, we can use this kind of metrics also to compare the skill of different models. Here we have an example of two models compared to the same ocean color, root mean square deviation maps which are different from the two, they do not look like, but if we compute the difference, the percentage different, difference between the root mean square deviation in these two cases, you can for example assess that the model 2 is better than the model 1 because the root mean square deviation is lower 
in most of the spatial domain. So this skin matrix also to evaluate and uh, compare the performance of different models. More com complex approaches, for example, we can compare uh, the, um, the variability of the two by using principal component analysis, where you try to describe the variability in the model output and the variability in the satellite by reducing, uh, for example, by simplifying the spatial structure of the two and compare the spatial structure of the two in terms of the principal components of their variability. So, for example, uh, Momet, Butenschen, in this work, has been comparing uh, the spatial temporal variability in the Northeast Atlantic of primary production, estimated from model and from satellite data. Here we have the representation of the first two components of the PCA from the model output and from the satellite. We see that the first component is very similar in the two, and as well the second, even if there is a small shift of the values. Do not worry if you do not understand this. I will give you all the references, and this we will not talk about many more about this in the rest of the presentation. But just to mention that we have complex techniques that you can find in these papers. Please read them. But we will not look see more application of these methods during the, this talk. So. This was the methodology. Now a little bit of issues. This is the target diagram for the output of three models of the North Atlantic compared to CCI data of the North Atlantic chlorophyll concentration. And look how well the three compare to each other. All the three are here. We are within the radius of one, so good skill for all of them. Very similar models. These models are Nemo, uh, sorry, uh, Medusa, uh, Piscus, and Ursen. Very good. This is the primary production at the surface from all these models. It's completely different. So the skill and very representation of chlorophyll was very similar in terms of skill metrics. But look, primary production in Medusa, completely different from the one in Piscus, and again different from the one in Ursum. Primary production directly related to chlorophyll. So that's to say. And why these were different? Because, and here we are looking at the fluxes of, I think, carbon between the different components of this model, different compartments, different state variables, DIC, bacteria, phytoplankton, DOC, POC, and, and zooplankton. These are a representation of the fluxes of carbon between the different uh, models, and you see they are completely different. So the fluxes that produced that field of chlorophyll that was so similar in the three models are completely different inside the model. Just to say, for example, why? Bacteria, it's the only model that is representing bacteria, is Ursum. So these kind of fluxes were not possible to represent in the other models. So there is diversity of the models, also that explain the differences in the fluxes. Still, they produce the same output for chlorophyll <coughs> in terms of skill metric. So lessons, OK, we were validating chlorophyll. You can express a, judge, a judgment of chlorophyll. You cannot say that your model is skilled in representing primary production because we see it's not the case. So what we really want is to have multivariate approaches uh, to assess the skill of the model. If we had also data on the fluxes of primary production from in situ data, we would have expressed a more uh, robust skill assessment for our variables. But that's not often the case that we have in situ data and so on. So there is some other approach that we can use other than the cold skill metric to assess the performance of our model. Yes, there is. We can use and we can look at the so-called emergent properties of the ecosystem. So 
at the next, uh, next slide, I'm sure it will be much easier to understand without these emergent properties, but they are features of the ecosystem hmm, that in the model are not expressly represented by means of differential equations, but some characteristics, some shapes of the model that come out because of the influence of the forcing function, because of the interaction with the other model state variables. And by assessing and comparing emergent properties from data and from model, we can have a better insight on the skill of our model, even if maybe not quantitative, but on his capacity to represent the processes in the ecosystem. Okay, just to give a name to the things, for example, if we are looking at the plankton community structure, I'm not sure that you have seen this. This is from Ocean Color. Bob has shown it, this to you. You know what is plankton functional types, how can you derive from total chlorophyll? So this is total chlorophyll, phytoplankton functional types, uh, the shape of the fraction of microplankton, for example, as a function of total chlorophyll. Hmm? The structural composition, the relative importance of the different phytoplankton groups within the community can be seen as emergent properties of models that describe these functional types. Because nowhere in a model we are describing, okay, if chlorophyll is 100, phytoplankton concentration of uh, diatoms equal total multiplied by one third. No, it's something that comes out because you have described, for example, uh, their competition for, for nitrate and so on. And so this property can emerge from the model. So Bob, from this uh, representation uh, derived from in situ data, then plotted uh, this data using satellite, uh, concentration, so the spatial distribution at one month of the micro, nano, and picoplankton in the global ocean. So and this is ge a general property that is ve verified with in situ data. Everybody accepts, for example, that picoplankton is dominant in the gyres, that you can have diatops more in the north waters, in, in the uh, north oceans. So some general properties that everyone would say, yes, uh, we know that. So can we, a model, reproduce these properties that from observation are so obvious? So here we have a comparison of model output and data, ocean color, uh, fraction of phytoplankton functional types in the global ocean for diatoms, flagellates, and picoplankton. And we are comparing the shapes derived from the model output and from ocean color. So we see that diatoms, for example, the two shapes correspond. And also we have, for example, the, lower va uh, the higher values of diatoms. Sorry, you cannot see, but this is a different colors, different regions of the global ocean. This is the Arctic, both in the model and in the data, we have more diatoms, the higher fraction of diatoms in the total community in the Arctic. Good for diatoms, not very good for flagellates and for picoplankton, the correspondence between model and data. So we are not going to see why the model was not able to capture the structure captured by the model, by the data, but you understand this is a different approach, very new. Uh, Lee de Mora has just published this kind of work, uh, this comparison uh, last year. And I think it's a very interesting approach because, I mean, you are not just simply comparing the chlorophyll concentration, but all the processes that are leading to that ratio of one phytoplankton types within the community, which implies competition, uh, correct representation of the influence of light, uh, grazing, selective grazing, and so on. So it's a, a, an overall picture of the system. So, but in applying this kind of method, still we have no many quantitative tools, so it implies some qualitative judgments. I told you diatoms looks good, nanophytoplankton less good, so expert judgment is needed and, uh, and care in applying this method. Have I killed you? Because just now we start with the second part, which is data simulation. Any question on this first part? No? Okay. Yeah. So how are you picking the, the effect points so that you're having um, like enough satellite data as well as 
uh, sorry, that you have? So how are you picking the correct points to get enough like in-situ data as well as satellite data, as well as model output? Like, does it, is it like a collaboration between another, a lot of people who then you know which time you can go for data? Hey, this is a very good point. Um, unfortunately, uh, most of the time, uh, there is not this kind of good communication. So I'm looking on the website. Okay, for satellite data, yes, there is a good collaboration, I would say, above all here at PML, because we have these two groups of modeling and, uh, and remote sensing, so we are talking a lot to each other. Ah, look, I would need this data, ta -ta 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 -ta, so we organize things. For the in-situ data, most of the time, I'm using, okay, we have the monitoring station at L4, which is very good to this kind of uh, game at three, uh, ocean color, in-situ, and models. Otherwise, I'm going on the website and collecting publicly available data sets. For example, we will see some here in the case studies. Hmm? So, data simulation, what is that, why? Are we talking about this? Okay, uh, this is a forecast, I'm sorry for you, of the weather in the next days uh, here in UK, rain, okay, we didn't need this to guess so. Uh, this is a product of the most notorious application of data simulation. The meteorological agency use models to make forecasts of the weather. So we have a forecast of what will be five day, in five days. Tomorrow, they will rerun the model assimilating the, day, the data of tomorrow to get a better prediction of what's going on in five days. Data simulation is a tool to merge model simulation and observation to produce better estimates of the state of the system. Estimates that can be for the future in operational forecasting, weather prediction, or for the past, where we have so-called reanalysis, where we run a model for the past using data that we have already collected, but to get a better estimate of what was going on in the past. I will focus mostly on this, reanalysis, looking at the past. Any If it's possible to use in situ data as in data simulation, yes, 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 yes. But instead of uh, uh, in situ data, can we use satellite observations for the simulation of models? For the simulation, yes, it's what, was, it's what we are going to talk about today the assimilation of ocean color. For example, this is a prediction of how it will be the oxygen concentration at the surface of the Mediterranean on the 24th of September. So these kind of tools uh, is already in use in biogeochemical modeling. And this is produced by assimilating ocean color. And uh, so we have already this possibility to produce forecasts of the system. And this is the Siemens. It's a Siemens product, the Copernicus uh, monitoring modeling, environmental monitoring, system monitoring. I don't remember the acronyms, but in Europe, for example, we have already predictions of the state of the biogeochemistry in the shelf seas uh, produced operationally. So, what is about, what is this data simulation? How can we apply? And a little bit of methods. So we have already seen this. This is what a model without data simulation does. It produces an estimate of the variables. In data simulation, we produce a forecast using the model. A data from the satellite in this today, it's become available and we correct the model output to produce an analysis. We use this analysis as a new initial condition for the subsequent prediction by the model. Anytime a, a data come, we correct our forecast. Okay? This is data simulation, roughly speaking. The thing is that we pretend, we, <laughs> we want, to get the analysis close to the true state of the ecosystem. This is all about data simulation. A true state that we are assuming is somewhere in the between the model prediction and the satellite data. So we are aiming at the true state, even if we are getting close to the satellite data. 
then we can compare hmm, the forecast and the analysis with the satellite data and to say, okay, my data simulation system works, I have improved my estimate of ocean color, and so on. But the real challenge here is to see if you are improving in C2 data of the variables. Because the data that you are assimilating, it's obvious that you are getting better. You, are, you have a, a mathematical system that aims to go closer to the data. So you want to compare to in C2 data. Behind all this, there is a lot of mathematics, more or less complex. But what I want to focus here is that to make the corrections of the model towards the data, you are weighting the errors in the model and in the data. So my data simulation system is looking at the value of the data and of the model at their errors, and they decide, OK, I'm moving, I'm correcting by 3 milligrams liter my prediction. OK? So it's extremely important to assess, to have an evaluation of the errors of the model and of the data. Shuba has been talking a lot how important was the effort in estimating the per pixel error in the CCI data set because we need it in data simulation. So the nice thing is that with many of these data simulation methods, you're not just correcting the ocean, the chlorophyll concentration that you are simulating, but you can correct also variables that you are not observing for satellite considering the covariances between the chlorophyll and nitrate, for example. So when I com I'm correcting chlorophyll, which I'm observing from space, I'm also correcting uh, nitrate, for which I have not observation, by means of the covariances estimated by the data simulation system. This is the real challenge. When I'm assimilating chlorophyll, what happens to my estimates of nitrate? Sometimes I can improve them, and this is cool. I'm assimilating ocean color, and I'm improving the estimate of nitrate. But the reality is that very often you deteriorate the performance of your model for the variables that you are not assimilating. We will see why. So, but the nice thing, I think the most, the nicest may be, is that you can also uh, estimate through data simulation parameters of the model. For example, the phytoplankton growth uh, rate. Again, by looking at the cross covariances between the chlorophyll that you are simulating and these parameters in the model. I'm afraid we will not have time to talk about this kind of application, which is the nicest one. So, how very data simulation methods, sorry. This is the one that I'm using currently and for which we will see several applications is the ensemble Kalman filter where we are running an ensemble of parallel simulations because these give us the chance to estimate the covariances between um, chlorophyll, if we are stim assimilating chlorophyll, and all the other model state variables. No need really to understand uh, the method, the details of this, but just to say, okay, this is easy to implement because you have some routines that you can download from the web, attach to your model, and you can run the data simulation from scratch without knowing that much. It's nice because it produces estimates of the error of the model at each time step. It allows multivariate analysis. I'm assimilating ocean color, but I can improve the estimates of nitrate. And it has some drawbacks. For example, one of the hypotheses of the mathematics which is, uh, on which this method is based that your uh, data, your model state variables have a Gaussian distribution, which is not often the case because maybe they, is, uh, they have a log normal distribution, so you have to correct and pa 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 pa. And the method for very highly nonlinear and no Gaussian system can be a failure. And it's very, very expensive to run. Rather than running one model simulation, you have to run 100, for example, in parallel. I'm running it on Archer on 7,200 CPU, which is a lot. 
A nice thing, and we will talk a lot about this, is that it allows you an estimate of the uncertainty of your model output. Simply because you are running an ensemble of parallel model simulations, by looking at the distribution of the values within the ensemble, you can guess, or you can get estimates of the uncertainty of your model output. So, some case studies, four of them, uh, data simulation to, as, to estimate ecosystem indicators on a shelf C, data simulation to, of chlorophyll to detect global trends of phytoplankton, we will use a global model, uh, data simulation of plankton functional types, something in which I'm working uh, in these days, I will submit a paper in these days, and data simulation of remote sensing reflectance, which is really a very fascinating and maybe game changer uh, that has been published recently. So this is uh, a simulation of ocean chlorophyll, of ocean color chlorophyll to estimate indicators. A paper that we have published last year, it's the first decadal reanalysis of the biogeochemistry in an ecosystem. So just to tell you how, how new are these kind of things. Decadal uh, reanalysis in, uh, in atmospheric science are uh, 20, 30 years old. We are producing uh, the first for the biogeochemistry of shelf seas just nowadays, so it's something new. And we use this to, in particular, to focus on uh, oxygen deficiency and to estimate the uncertainty of our model outputs, some arguments that are quite new and were picked up by the media when the paper came out. So, the methods, we have seen all of them. So, the model, it's ERSEM coupled with POLCOMS. Uh, the assimilation scheme is the ensemble Kalman filter. The data that we have assimilated, it's the CCI version 2. And we made use of the errors, per pixel errors of this data, to define the uncertainty of the observation and so to drive the corrections of our model predictions. And we assess the, the scale of the output by using in situ data that we have found on the web, which is ISIS and SOCAT datasets. SOCAT, PCO2, and ISIS, all the other data. So we run a reanalysis for 1998-2009. This is the average value of chlorophyll from the model without data simulation, average value of the data and the average value after doing data simulation. So, it's evident the difference between this and this, this and this, really uh, not very clear the reference and the other difference. So, let's use some quantitative metrics to assess the difference. So, we have seen all this. This is the root mean square deviation of the data simulation output and the data at each grid point. And this is the correlation between data simulation and observation. So we see the correlation is very high in most of the domain apart this area and this area on the coast. But here we have very few data actually that we have assimilated because it's quite north and we have a small fraction of data during the year available because it's dark and so the satellite cannot see. And here we have a high uncertainty of the model output so, oh, sorry, I uh, certainty of the satellite observation because of land inputs of color dissolved organic matter and so on. So, this compared the root mean square deviation and the correlation of the data simulation output minus the reference output, root mean square deviation, and this is the, we see that we managed to decrease the root mean square deviation in 60% of the domain and improve the correlation in 30% of the domain. So, data simulation improved uh, the estimation of chlorophyll ocean color in most of the domain, respect the reference simulation. But we said this is the easy job because we are comparing with the data that we have simulated. The, 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 the thing is here, okay, what did happen to the variables that we have not assimilated? So we here we are comparing 14 in situ uh, data set for 14 variables, sorry, in a target diagram, a robust one, so skill metrics that looks at the percentiles of the distributions. 
And here we have scatter plots. For example, we see temperature, high scale, and it's close to the center. Nitrate, we are overestimating it. Bad skill. PCO2, mm, medium skill, because we are overestimating the high value, underestimating the low value. Dissolved oxygen, quite a good skill. And here it is, close to the center. So let's focus on dissolved oxygen, which is quite an important ecosystem indicator because, okay, if there is no oxygen, fishes die. So it's an eco a key ecosystem indicator. So it's an essential climate variables defined by GCOVs. In the Marine Strategy Framework Directive, it's one of the indicators that you must consider. And it's also fixed by the OSPAR, which is the Commission for the North uh, Atlantic. In particular, OSPAR said a concentration of 6 milligram liters of this is a, a threshold for defining the oxygen deficiency. Because below this concentration, publications have seen where fishes can die and so on. So this is the map from my reanalysis of the minimum value of dissolved oxygen on the shelf we can see that large areas are below the OSPAR uh, threshold. Here I am plotting the median value of the ensemble. I told you I'm running an ensemble of simulation of 100 values. Here I'm representing the median value of the ensemble. But since we have the 100 ensemble, from that distribution we can estimate the uncertainty on our output by looking, for example, at when just one of the ensemble members fell below the threshold, we define this, the 1% confidence, 100, all the ensemble fell below the threshold, we have 100% confidence that we are talking about a risk of oxygen deficiency in that point, point of the shelf. So this is a map of areas that are potentially deficient in oxygen, according to the OSPAR Commission, at 100% confidence, red areas, and at 100% uh, confidence, yellow areas. This matched well with um, in-situ data that were, or other evaluation that were made for the uh, Northeast Atlantic. And we are using this kind of information now currently in a project called TAPAS to assess risks and opportunities for aquaculture in uh, European shelf seas. Okay, uh, data simulation to detect global trends of chlorophyll. So the starting point is this publication by Watson Gregg, which is a god in data simulation of ocean color, that uh, he noticed that the sea with data average values on the global ocean and the MODIS had quite a little bit of mismatch. These are years, these are average value of concentration in the global ocean. So when looking at them separately, the two time series show no trends in the global ocean chlorophyll concentration. When you put together the two time series, you obtain a statistically significant negative trend of, ocean of uh, chlorophyll concentration in the global ocean, which is quite surprisingly. These guys have produced the time series by merging the two, and they have assimilated them, and the results of the data assimilation exercise showed that there was no global trend in the ocean chlorophyll, in the chloroph global chlorophyll concentration. In particular, in a more recent publication where they have put together SeaWiths, MODIS, and VIRS data, they saw that actually the satellite data do not detect any significant trend in the global ocean chlorophyll. After they assimilated this data, they confirmed, okay, it's true, chlorophyll uh, from satellite is correct, there is no global trend. In doing this exercise of data simulation to detect global trends, they applied the NASA Ocean Biogeochemical Model, which describe biology, describe the optical properties of the marine ecosystem, and describe uh, the carbon system. 
by applying this method and the quite simple uh, data simulation method, they produce the reanalysis of the global ocean uh, chlorophyll spanning years 1998-2015, and then they assessed the trends in the global ocean of the total chlorophyll. So this is a map of the trend in percentage per year of the chlorophyll concentration in the global ocean. They reported just values that were statistically significant, I think, at the 95% confidence level. So what we can say, ah, and then this model, it's a, an ecosystem model, total chlorophyll is computed as a sum of four phytoplankton groups, which include diatoms, uh, cyanobacteria, and chlorophytes. So they computed also the global trends of these three functional groups. And that, with those, they explain which trend they observed for total chlorophyll. For example, total chlorophyll had statistically and high decreases uh, of total chlorophyll in the Indian Ocean. And these match a decrease in the diatoms and in the chlorophyte which was compensated by an increase, statistically significant, of cyanobacteria. So, the fact is that diatoms and, to a certain sense, chlorophytes are nitrophil. They like high concentration of nitrate, while cyanobacteria, they like less. So, there was a shift in the phytoplankton composition that, they argue, was related to a change in the nitrate of the nutrient concentration in this ocean. Still, this is just a 17 years long time series, so they did not feel to give an explanation on why these statistically significant changes are occurring, and so they just put the hypothesis. Is this a long-term trend, or is just a natural variability related to the Indian Ocean Dipole? Then another change that they saw was here, there was not change in the total chlorophyll, which was statistically significant. But looking at the, plant, uh, the phytoplankton types, they saw that there was a statistically significant decrease in uh, diatoms, which was in part compensated by increase in cyanobacteria and in chlorophyte. So again, we had a switch of the plankton composition for total chlorophyll had not a statistically significant change. So a quite interesting result that you could obtain just because you are using a model that is simulating plankton types. Again, the series is short. We do not really know why this is happening. It's uh, climate change or it's Pacific decadal oscillations. They do not offer an answer yet. But let's go back to this diatom trend. Diatoms are nitrophil. In a previous publication of the same guys, they applied the same model and they produced some maps of statistically significant changes in mixed layer depth and in nitrate. So the mixed layer depth got shallower, nitrate decreased, both statistically significant, diatom I am army now, decreased because there was less nitrate. So unfortunately, these are two different papers, but putting them together, we can obtain kind of explanation and interpretation of this result. This just to say, OK, models in this case are a mean to get more data that we cannot observe from satellite, nitrate, and are a mean to explain the mechanisms that are beyond the processes uh, the, 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 the observation that we can obtain. Lessons, okay, uh, I mean, let's be careful when we are looking at the observation and trend that we can um, figure out from uh, just looking at the ocean color. Let's use also model and data simulation to better interpret them, putting on the plate also the mechanism that can be the driver of the changes and we can observe significant shifts and trends in the plankton functional composition of the global ocean. So PFTs, plankton, plankton functional types, are quite important to understand the changes that are occurring in the ocean. 
So why do not assimilate them since we can have ocean color products for these? Why we do not assimilate them directly in our models is what we are doing in this project called TOSCA for the Copernicus Marine Environmental Monitoring Service, the monitoring. Uh, where we are assimilating diatoms, dinoflagellae, nanoplankton, picoplankton from ocean color into ERSEM uh, for the Northeast Atlantic. Uh, the model is always the same, the assimilation scheme is the same. The data have been produced by Bob in a recent work uh, this year within this project uh, TOSCA. And again, we are using in situ data to assess the skill of their analysis. So, these are diatoms, dinoflagellae, nanoplankton, picoplankton, and total chlorophyll from the reanalysis. This is the root mean square deviation of the four of the five with respect to the ocean color data. We are not doing well for diatoms, it's quite evident. Huh? But still, if we compare to the reference simulation without that assimilation, we improved remarkably. The, these are root mean square deviation. We have improved all of them, but nanoplankton. You see a lot of red. We increase the root mean square deviation with respect to the model without that assimilation. What is it nice here is that we improved also the simulation of total chlorophyll, which was not assimilated directly. And if we compare, we did an exercise of assimilating total chlorophyll instead than the phytoplankton types, and the assimilation of the PFTs outperform the assimilation of total chlorophyll, also for the total chlorophyll itself. So the assimilation of phytoplankton types looks very good to estimate the ocean color data of PFTs as well as total chlorophyll. Here, the ocean color data and the our model outputs are represented in terms of ratio of the phytoplankton types on the total community for diatoms, dinoflagellae, nanoplankton, and picoplankton. These are the same quantities from the ocean color produced by Bob, and we can see that the root mean square deviation with respect to the model without that assimilation decreased for all the plankton types, also for nanoplankton, meaning that we improved the simulation of an emergent property of the ecosystem, which is the plankton structure within the Northeast Atlantic, if we compare to the model without that assimilation. Again, we compare with the in-situ data of plankton functional types in this case, where we represent reference squares, the model without assimilation, and circle the model with assimilation. The, here we have microplankton, diatoms, uh, nanoplankton, picoplankton, in all the cases we are closer to the center, meaning that we improve the simulation of the in-situ data of plankton functional types, even if, if they were very few these data available. Even more interestingly, we improve the simulation of some biogeochemical variables that we have data in situ. For example, PCO2, we see that the circle that assimilation is closer to the center. Assimilating plankton functional type improved the simulation of the PCO2 in the system. Quite an exciting result. We improved phosphate simulation, but we also deteriorate nitrate. So, there is some uh, drawbacks. Since it came well, we will focus on PCO2. So, PCO2, this is the partial pressure. Uh, average value from our simulation, and this is how it changed after the assimilation with respect to the model without that assimilation. So we saw that the partial pressure increased in most of the basin apart in this area. This is related to the fact that in our simulation we decreased the net ecosystem production by the uh, living community of this ecosystem. As a consequence of the change in the partial pressure, we changed also the fluxes of PCO2 at the RC interface. So, just to say, the assimilation of the plankton functional type into the ecosystem model impacted and brought to a revision of previous estimates of the carbon fluxes towards, from the atmosphere towards the shelf, thanks to the assimilation of this data. 
So, uh, plankton types assimilation is good and produced a lot of nice results and hopefully we will see this method implemented operationally at the Met Office uh, in the future, hopefully. So, we have still 10 minutes to completely kill you. So, let's see this last, res last, um, last work by colleagues at Xairo uh, in Australia, where they assimilated remote sensing reflectance to constrain an ecosystem model which includes uh, the Great, uh, great uh, Barrier Reef. Uh, it's, a, it's a very new work because typically Till now, we have assimilated plankton functional type, and sorry, total chlorophyll. I'm doing PFTs for the first time. These guys, for the first time, went back to the origins of the satellite ocean color. They are assimilating remote sensing reflectance. So, they have a quite complex uh, biogeochemical model that simulate uh, uh, the, <clears throat> the distribution of four phytoplankton groups in the ocean. No need to go in the details of this biogeochemical model, but just let's say that they have coupled this model with a bio-optical model, which bring as a model output distribution of the remote sensing reflectance at different wavelengths. So, their idea is, okay, let's assimilate directly remote sensing reflectance into this model coming from satellite data. Actually, they do something slightly different. They say the OC3M product computed from satellite is often computed from satellite using the remote sensing reflectance is often used as a proxy of total chlorophyll. And also when we are doing that assimilation, we are using this O3CM as if it was total chlorophyll. But they say, maybe it's true for the open ocean, for sure it's not true on the coastal. So let's think that this remote sensing O3CM product is not chlorophyll. It's something more complex, which is also a function of total suspended solid, particular inorganic carbon, dissolved organic matter, and so on. And let's derive from our model using the remote sensing reflectance an O3CM kind of data derived considering total suspended solids and so on. And they, they thesis is okay, it's better to assimilate O3CM, imagining it as a function of all these things, rather than just as if it was chlorophyll. Why they did this? Because looking at the, an image of OC3M from satellite and comparing it at model output, where OC3M was just the sum of the chlorophyll of the phytoplankton groups or a function of a lot of optical active compounds, they say these two looks much sim more similar than these two. I'm not totally convinced eh, because it's hard to see a similarity between the two. Probably they didn't pick up the best image to bring on this argument. But in any case, they are assimilating OC3M as a function of all these fun things from the model. These are the results. For example, comparing with profiles of chlorophyll from a glider, this is the profile of the model without that assimilation. This is the profile by assimilating OC3M from satellite as if it was chlorophyll, and here as if it was a function of many more variables in the model. Okay, you will see here there are no output. Why? Because the model crashed. The data simulation system assimilating chlorophyll, assimilating OC3M as if it was chlorophyll, crashed. And this argued this is also one of the reasons mm, OC3M in the coastal area cannot be used as a proxy of chlorophyll because our model blows up, because there are many uh, problems. 
while when they are simulating OC3M as a function of many things, they get quite closer to the observation of the glider. At least with respect to the model without that assimilation, they decrease the bias. Still, they were not able to reproduce uh, the chlorophyll maximum at depth. Not surprisingly, you are observe, assimilating ocean color, which is a product at the surface, even if it's remote sensing reflectance. We can see this problem even better on this figure, which is the profile of the root mean square deviation of those comparisons averaged over time and showed as a function of the depth. So root mean square deviation at depth for different setup of the assimilation system. So the data assimilation of OC3M as if it was chlorophyll, it's the worst because the root mean square error is the highest. The model without data assimilation was not that different, while the assimilation of OC3M as if it was a function of many compounds is the best one, the one with the lowest root mean square deviation, you see. We will notice also that all the outputs are quite similar at depth higher than 100. Just to say that the assimilation of ocean color hardly impacts the simulation of your model at depth, which are, uh, which are higher, often uh, deeper than a mixed layer depth. Because at the end, you are simulating something that can see just the surface of the ocean. In this graph, they also showed that the assimilation of this product it's uh, much better than the model without that assimilation to make five-day predictions on the shelf. So it's uh, also a very useful, potentially operational to tool to improve the estimates of the state of the system at five days, in this case, uh, <coughs> advance. But the nicest thing, I think, of this work or that fascinated me a lot, it, this is an image on the same area of true color from data from the satellite. These guys, since they are simulating remote sensing reflectance, with some magic, they can reproduce the true color from their model output. So I've never seen before a model output presented as a true color. And this is nice, I think. So this is the model without data simulation. And this is the true color from satellite. And we can see that there are differences and so on. They do the exercise of data simulation of remote sensing reflectance. And this is the average value of the true color during the period of simulation. And this is closer to this one. Here, we are really going by eye. Maybe this is also an emergent property, I would say, no? It's nice. Uh, but even nicer, I think, it's that somehow they computed the differences in color between the two. I don't know nothing about optics, so I don't know how they did, but they could see that the difference between uh, the model and the data simulation output is there is more yellow here, and there is less green here. This is green, I'm sorry, you cannot see very well, but so in practice, uh, the data simulation took out green color and no, put green color, uh, yellow color on the estuary and took out green color on the open shelf. That is yellow matter, quantitatively, and it's uh, phytoplankton biomass for the green. So I think this is really potentially a game changer for data simulation and so on. Because, OK, we show that at skill, it's nice. It improved the five-day prediction. It allows the comparison of like to like. Because if we are looking at chlorophyll, our model, for example, maybe it's not representing all the functional types in the system. Maybe I'm not modeling dinoflagellates because my model is not capable. While ocean color, see also chlorophyll. So if I compare chlorophyll, maybe there is this problem of difference in, in kind that I mentioned at the beginning. If I'm assimilating remote sensing reflectance, in theory, I'm avoiding this problem. Just in theory, I think. And we will see why. The thing is that remote sensing reflectance, if I'm not wrong, can be seen by a much larger number of satellites 
not just sea waves or stuff like that, because it's a property that also Hakinowara satellite, uh, I don't remember the name, can see, even if it's not specialized in ocean color. So potentially, we have a much larger uh, data set that we can use for model validation and data simulation. Still, we cannot really constrain underwater fields because satellites still can see just the surface. No? In this exercise, the assimilation, they show that the assimilation of these remote sensing reflectance, or at least the function of the remote sensing reflectance, outperformed chlorophyll assimilation. We have much more data, and they conclude this is much better than assimilating chlorophyll, assimilating plankton functional types, and I feel touched because I'm, I'm submitting now the paper on that, and they say, no, it's much better than that. But my doubt is, if we are simulating, modeling and assimilating this, are we simply passing the problem? They say, and one of the arguments is, if we are trying to retrieve uh, phytoplankton types, chlorophyll POC from satellite, we are actually using a lot of algorithms that are empirical while in the model we can directly simulate that. But let's see, an ecosystem model produces states. It produces biomass, uh, biomass of phytoplankton, zooplankton, nitrate, and so on. Then we have bio-optical model that can take these states and translate them into optical properties, uh, absorption, and so on. And here we have the satellite observation. The guys say, let's include the bio-optical model inside the ecosystem model to produce the remote sensing reflectance that we can compare directly with satellite. While the traditional approach is we have a satellite model that produces remote sensing reflectance. I attach a bio-optical equations empirical to these to produce data of chlorophyll, PFTs, and POC. So, Empirical relationships, these are the critics of these authors. Limited validity in space and time, because this empirical formulation can hold here, but not there, I, I'm assuming. And there are high uncertainty. Errors for the PFT or for the POC can be 200%, they say. Actually, the problem with incorporating the bio-optical bio model inside the ecosystem model, it's that I did it you have to include a large number of new model equations with new parameterization. Inside a model that has already 300 parameters, you are adding other 50 parameters, the specific absorption of diatom, the specific, specific absorption of diatom. If you go in the literature, you see the specific absorption of uh, Plurococcus uh, angulatus, and you take this and you put it as if it was the specific absorption for the, of your diatom, which is a huge range. So it's a huge approximation. So all nice, but you are adding a lot of uncertainty to your ecosystem model if you are including the uh, inherent optical properties. It's not just that I'm envy of their work. We did it as well. It worked well. We assimilated uh, KD, which is remote um, diffuse light attenuation coefficient, outperformed chlorophyll. So having done this, I say we have to think what is better to do and what's the path for the future. So take home messages. All what I've talked about today, it's really new. I mean, these are papers published last year or submitted. So everything new. And it's great that you are listening to this and you will do great contribution to this area. Model can provide insights in the ecosystem functioning and information of things uh, that you have not observed, you are, cannot observe from space, nitrate. All marine models should be validated. Ocean color is useful to do that, but you have to be careful to the methods, to the conclusions, and for sure it's useful and this is a new branch of research to use also uh, in situ data for assimilation, simultaneous to uh, ocean color assimilation. And this is something that they are doing now at Copernicus, assimilating um, the BGG uh, biogeochemical uh, Argo floats data with the surface ocean color. Uh, 
watch out to the mismatches between model output and, uh, uh, and ocean color observation, POC. Does it include bacteria or not? Chlorophyll, are you modeling dinoflagellates? These kind of things. Ocean color, it's hypnotic, high frequency of data, very great, but just to surface, how do you we constrain what's going on on the deep? And there can be a lot of uncertainty, but just now we are starting to quantify. And this is again an essential information to do a data simulation. Otherwise, in the past, the error of the data is 35% of the value of ocean color, which didn't lead to very good results above all in coastal waters. Explicit uh, uh, modeling and simulation of uh, optical um, data like remote sensing reflectance offers new opportunities but new challenges. And again, I mean, it's very important. Me, I would not be uh, able to do my job if I was not talking to Bob or to someone else to explain me what is the, the things that I am assimilating every day. So I really need him. Uh, so the communication between the scientists and ecosystem modelers is really crucial, crucial to not do very terrible mistakes in this area. So there are many references and so on, but a reading that I'm recommending is a, a UCC, so International Ocean Color Climate Change. Yes, that one is producing a report which is exactly what I talked to you today. The role of ocean color in biogeochemical ecosystem climate modeling, brackets, chapters on model validation and data assimilation, problems of intercomparison and so on. We are writing it now uh, under the lead, lead, uh, lead of uh, Stephanie Dutkiewicz and end of the year or beginning of the next should be uh, available to everybody. So I want to acknowledge the persons that have helped me in preparing this presentation, and I thank you for your attention.